Uh, well, now we come to the last event of the evening, and hopefully they save the best for last. Um, well, it's basically, you know, something to wrap up what has been what has transpired the last two days and all that, and we'll just keep it simple and 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 uh, you know straightforward since it's been a long day and all that. Basically, what 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 we'd like to do is maybe give each of the speakers say four or five minutes just to wrap up. What um, what they have said, you know, in addition to what they have said the, the, for the for the papers and all that, any last words that they have said concerning what they talk about about security in general, and then after that we just have you know maybe a Q and A from the floor about security issues in general, either address to the whole panel or to a particular speaker or a particular panelist. And okay, we we'll just do it this way, and then keep it simple. We we'll just go down this way. We we'll start with you, Adam. Yeah, talk about. Maybe you are talking about mobile devices and security. Maybe any other things you want to add to, to that, you know? Okay. Good afternoon to you all. I am Adam Govjak from Poznan Super Computing and Networking Center. Uh, in this year's Hack in the Box Security Conference, I was giving a speech about the security of J2ME, which means I was basically talking about security of Java technology for mobile devices. I showed that there are ways to bypass security of Java for mobile phones. I also showed that there are ways to, for example, do something nasty on mobile phones or, for example, my Nokia phone. And actually, the goal of my talk was to, to, to show that even if a given device is closed or even if a given security technology has a very solid background, which of which I think Java technology has a very solid background, a very good design. And very often, sometimes, uh, very little small implementation flaws can affect the whole security of such a technology and can simply break it apart. So what I wanted to, to emphasize during my, my talk is that threats uh, regarding mobile devices is increasing uh, constantly and uh, in the past we, we have actually experienced attacks uh, targeting Unix systems, then we uh, experienced attacks targeting uh, Windows platform and I think that in the near future, which means that within the six month period, we might uh, experience attacks targeting mobile platforms with, and especially open platforms that is uh, Symbian OS, Windows C or Palm OS uh, based devices. So that was in, in brief the, the, uh, what my talk was about and what my goal of giving this talk was about. Thank you. Uh, Jose? Uh, Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jose Nazario. I came and spoke about how to program uh, security uh, or, or, or network reconnaissance tools basically using four libraries, uh, libpcap, libnid, libevent, and uh, libdnet. Um, my goal was uh, simply to educate some people mainly about how to write tools. I want I, I basically am convinced that there aren't enough tool authors out there. There have been a number of tool authors uh, who have basically gone on to become hired or, or too busy in, mainly to, to write their to write, write new tools and write more tools. And so I want more people to write them and to uh, create new, new designs, basically. We're kind of... Uh, stuck, if you will, with some of the old tools, and they've been good tools, but I think that there are many more things that can be can happen out there, and so I want to educate more people so they can begin to write them and and, uh, and do more with them. Um, specifically, I'm, I'm more interested in targeting a security administrator or someone who's allowed to kind of peek at the network, but I, I know that there's always going to be people who are malicious who are going to do this as well. Um, it's just kind of what you have to accept, but I think if more people know how to do this, then more people will create more, more tools that are very interesting and in inventory the networks, for example, or create new defenses. And that was basically my goal. And hopefully, I achieved it. Thank you. Can uh, Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was not a speaker today, so I think my wrap up going to be a little bit longer than, than the previous speakers. Okay, I'm, I'm uh, representing the National ICT Security and Emergency Response Center for Malaysia. So I'll be speaking uh, uh, in, 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 in particular on, on the Malaysian context. Um, 
I would like to take this opportunity to uh, first to thank you, the, uh, the uh, organizer, for inviting me and speaking to you. I would like to highlight that there is a need for cooperation between your side, yourselves, and, and my side, in which NICER is also uh, running the Malaysian cert called MyCert, if you do not know it yet. Why do we need to cooperate? Because you know that we cannot, uh, it is impossible for certs, for team like the, uh, for the organization that I have to know everything. So I need uh, uh, extended arms from your side. If, for example, one, there are vulnerabilities found, if you find any serious vulnerabilities on uh, especially on, on, on popular, uh, uh, dominant popular platform, which can potentially become the outbreak that can seriously damage the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the business in the world or in Malaysia in specific. So I would like, I would urge you to, to, um, to at, least at least communicate to us or, or talk to us about your findings before, before you just shoot it out to everybody else in the world. Because I would see that it would be uh, very helpful, uh, very considerate for you to at least give us time by telling us oh, what is it. Allow us to validate it. And if it's true, then we can even help you to uh, to, uh, to alert various uh, relevant parties on the need for them to take action. So uh, I'm also calling uh, for your cooperation as, as a good citizen uh, to provide important information on possible serious attacks. It could be done by some cunning groups out there just let us know so that I think it is our obligation all together, all of us, to ensure that the cyberspace are a place that is safe for everyone, not just in the physical world. So I think uh, we want to enjoy ourselves and, and, and to continue enjoying the, uh, the, uh, the fruits of the knowledge through the cyberspace. So I think we need to ensure that the cyberspace is is, is a peace place for everybody. A third, if you find any, any news on, on, on the act or possible act of cyber terrorism, please inform us. So this could be an early warning for us to act before it is too late. So in return, with all this uh, information and cooperation, what can we do? In return, uh, I can speak for Malaysia. So NICER is willing to, uh, to assist uh, and to communicate to the relevant parties in order to ensure that, that this thing is stopped. Um, if the uh, information found to be true, for example, the vulnerabilities found to be true through the, the uh, validation in the labs, we can also communicate to the vendors uh, it could be because many of the vendors are not in Malaysia. Those vendors are in the States or in, in, in Europe. So, uh, so uh, MySearch has, uh, has a, a, a link, a cooperation with, for example, FIRST Forum. Or many, other, many more forums that I will not mention to you in which we can relay this information to them. Um, and if the uh, the author or the originator of or the one that is that has found this or has has originated the uh, the findings would like to to be given the credit to it, we have no problem. We will give all due credits to you. Or if you want yourself to be to remain uh, a secret then we will maintain and respect that wish as well. So we are willing to, to listen. And I think we are the best party for you to, to communicate with. Because if you communicate with other parties, I would say, for example, um, uh, those, I would say, uh, uh, non-techies, they might not understand your language. They might not appreciate what you're saying. So I think we are the interfacing for you. 
If we do not understand you, then I think nobody else may understand you. So, so please let us uh, understand you. What is it? In what context? If I do not understand your technical language, I will find somebody who can understand that, your technical language and translate it to me, so that I can take a strategic action to whatever repercussion of those findings. So this is a call from me uh, as a responsible citizen of Malaysia. I think we have to ensure that the Malaysian cyberspace are a place for everybody to benefit. So with that, I, I thank you. Thank you, Colonel uh, Theo. Uh, yes, hello. Um, I came to talk about some exploit mitigation techniques that we did in OpenBSD. I'm just going to do a quick little sort of um, add-on to uh, the talk that I gave. Um, these problems are really happening due to uh, just generic flaws that are happening in, in the software that we write. And this is sort of an artifact of increasing complexity in the software that we're relying on these days. Complexity apparently in software is unbounded. This, every single time I download Mozilla, it turns out it's it's grown by 20 percent. This is this is crazy, um, and flaws are going to happen when we write software. It's an extremely uh, um, malleable space that we work on. We that that we, we do science and we mix it with art, and sometimes a little bit too much art gets involved, and that's when our science falls apart. So. As a, so a way to look at all of this, I suppose, in a way, is that these errors happen largely because of education. Okay, and education is is a serious problem. There's a lot of education um, missing in the development community. We have uh, uh, countless uh, programmers learning from other free, from other free, especially in the free software community, but also in the commercial space, learning from other software which has been written by other inexperienced programmers. So instead of our technology getting better as time progresses, in many ways it's getting sloppier and sloppier. Um. Um, and uh, this is uh, not quite the way that, for example, engineers would approach a problem. Engineers approach a problem by trying to build things in a robust way. They over-engineer things ten times over. Um, actually, or just uh, earlier this morning, I was in the Petronas Towers, and I, I heard the, the, the story that uh, one of the Petronas Towers was built by the Japanese, and one was built by the Koreans. And the Korean one's wobbly, okay? <laughs> but this is okay. It's, it's designed safely, because when you, when you engineer a product according to engineering standards, you typically, for each of your components, follow at least a 10 times over design, okay, for safety purposes. For example, this is why you don't see a lot of uh, four, four, three-wheel cars on the road, because a four-wheel car is actually safe for an accident. That's probably not the best example of all. So good engineering is key to, to uh, software development, and uh, that really is going to be a thing for education, that's really a, an education problem. And uh, I'm really curious to see how we're going to actually improve education for uh, the purposes of quality in the long term. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, you heard some, you know, final words from our panelists and all that. Maybe now I'd like to open to the floor and are there any questions with regard to the issues that have been raised the last two days or on other security issues in general? You want to address the issue of a particular panelist or even to the panel as a whole? Anybody? No? Not much of a fall. <laughs> yes. Then, then if not okay. from the floor, then I'll just yeah. say a few, few more words. Okay, just now I have mentioned to you about cooperation with my organization, NICER, or that's running sets. So I think last year I have reminded you on the balance, the need to balance between uh, technical inquisitiveness and also the law. So this year I would like again to remind you that it is okay, it is good to be uh, innovative, to know and to try, but you have also to, to know about the boundaries and what the limits are. And those boundaries and limits are, are laws. And there are many laws, laws that pertaining to this country uh, on, on, on computer crime, that need to be known as well. So in other words, you have to understand that there are such a, a, a provision in the Computer Crime Act 1997 in Malaysia that if you do an unauthorized access, you can be charged under Section 4. Or unauthorized access with modification will be more severe. Or uh, 
or intend to further commit crime will be severe. So you have to understand this, this and, and create a balance and know the limit. And we have to also respect other law, other, other countries' law. Some other countries may have different laws. They may be different than ours. But I think in the spirit of, of world cooperation, international cooperation, we have to try to respect those laws, even though uh, it's fun to, uh, to navigate through the cyberspace. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel. Uh, anybody has anything to say to that? Uh... Yeah. Actually, yeah. yeah. Actually, actually uh, <laughs> I actually have a comment uh, directly at that, uh, kind of to, to build upon that with a different perspective, if you will. Um, so I, I'm here from the States, and a number of the laws, both in the States and in, and in Europe increasingly, um, are written to a stage where it's kind of scary for some of us in terms of just doing research or doing work outside of uh, officially recognized boundaries. People are worried, for example, they're going to go to jail just for releasing information, and some people have been threatened with lawsuits, or um, but just for information, right? So we, we're all very familiar with how the RIA and the MPA and other organizations, uh, other industry organizations have threatened uh, for, for privacy violations, or um, have, threatened, have threatened for copyright violations. But it kind of goes beyond this, and people are abusing this both for uh, just, just their own interests and stuff like that. Um, um, that said, you know, these, these laws are important. Actually, as somebody who, who has created now a significant amount of uh, intellectual property and has copyright, it's, it's kind of changed my perspective on copyright law entirely. And it's, it's, been, you know, it's been good and it's been educational, but at the same time, you know, we, we also now have these competing um, attributes of, of increasing uh, of ease of communication. So, for example, uh, I, I talk with Kamala, and Kamala lives here in Malaysia, and I live in... in, uh, in um, in the States, and so we talk in more or less real time in IRC, and it's very easy to do that. And it's also very easy to share information of other types as well. So, um, for example, I can publish papers very easily uh, on the website. Um, but because of this, there's um, a lot of information that gets shared that sometimes is sort of unknown or uncertain to people. And that said, there's been a lot of um, laws, that, is, like I said, that have been written sort of vaguely uh, that can unfortunately be, be used by various people against you. And so um, keep it in mind. and. Because people are sort of keeping this in mind, what we're seeing is kind of this great intersection in large chunks of the community of legal education and legal um, uh, analysis, as well as technical analysis and social analysis. And I think that this is uh, very exciting to see kind of these barriers being brought down, more or less to ensure that what we've basically achieved with our, um, the, the widespread adoption of the internet can more or less continue very easily and unfettered. So. Getting, getting, yeah, I think it's important to get involved with organizations um, and governments alike and, and make sure that you're working with policymakers and understand the issues and can contribute um, a valuable perspective to kind of ensure that uh, things aren't written vaguely. And for example, as he, as, as, as the colonel has described, um, things that are more or less illegal, you know, are, um, are things that you'd reasonably expect to be illegal as well, not just um, things accidentally that became illegal as well. So I think it's, as we move further into the 21st century, I think that this is something that we're seeing, um, we need to see more and more of, and so I think that it's been um, very interesting. So, and then take with it a global perspective as well, which is also increasingly important. Thank you. Uh, anybody from the floor has anything to say? To is a question? Yeah, yes please. The microphone? The microphone? Is it working? Okay. Uh, I would like to share uh, two of my thoughts. Uh, number one, with, uh, with regards to uh, probably the Malaysian IT infrastructure. Uh, we have few uh, legal frameworks uh, passed by parliament. Uh, number one is the digital, uh, so the digital Crime Act. Number two is the uh, Digital Signature Act and the uh, Digital Signature Regulation, 1998. Now, uh, the question is, <coughs> though we have the Digital Crime Act, uh, we have the Court of Law where um, we submit evidence and you know we argue about it. But then, <coughs> uh, I have not seen uh, the Digital Signature Act being used uh, to basically uh, support the electronic evidence that we submit with regards to the uh, digital or computer crime that is involved. Uh, as far as Digital Signature Act is concerned, uh, an electronic 
evidence is submissible in the court of law as long as it is being digitally signed uh, using a certificate issued by a licensed CA. But then if electronic evidence is not signed in any way, so how can it be admissible in the court of law? So that uh, translates into etc. etc. things like uh, the validity of syslog. I think earlier there was one speaker who talked about uh, the um, possible challenge by some smart uh, lawyer uh, with regards to validity of uh, syslog, unsigned syslog. Okay, uh, number two, <coughs> uh, we're running a few internet lightning rods out there. So, <coughs> there are interesting uh, signs of activity. It's, it's global kind of uh, intrusion attempts. It's in the continent independent, uh, country independent, uh, platform independent. But uh, the, the, the idea is, uh, you know, the interesting part about this community in this hall is that really we can see an IT seminar with uh, lots of participants still staying back until the end. So I think we have kind of uh, uh, interested parties, interested individuals here out there uh, to concentrate on security. Uh, let's take uh, Internet Storm Center, for, for instance. It's a collaborative effort from various walks of community to establish, to share the uh, information about uh, intrusions, uh, figuring out what is the, uh, the, the highest number of attacks out there, from where the origination, things like that. I think uh, as far as Malaysia is concerned, we, we should probably, uh, among us, we should probably, and ISA could, could, could take a lead on that, uh, establish a centre where we can collaborate and, and, and start determining where the threats, what level, uh, so that this, these people could then uh, prepare the countermeasures uh, necessary to defence uh, each other's infrastructure. Uh, yes, sir. Okay, Thanks. thank you. Uh, well, maybe I, I, I should summar try and summarize if I can, right? Uh, I think basically you raised two points, right? One, one is, you know, uh, the use of things like digital signatures to actually uh, sign uh, evidence, uh, digital evidence, like, sit, like log, log files and all that, so that they can be, uh, so that they, they, they can't be really challenged in, in the court of law. Uh, is that being done here, is that what you're asking, right? Whether there's been evidence of that being done here, is it being, being carried out here? Is, is that what, what you, 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 are, you, yeah. you spoke about? Yeah, having, having people who actually practice in security. Uh, is it, is it? If, yeah, if you were to you know, uh, get my laptops, you, have, you can actually persecute me having you know, the, 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 the weapons of mass destruction. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so how, how do I protect myself so that people don't simply create a syslog that points back to me? Yeah, so we, we need some form of solid legal framework yeah. to, to defend uh, innocence okay. and the guilt. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And the other point you raise is whether is there any uh, effort being done by, by here, especially bodies are nicer, where you monitor possible uh, activities, that, you know, uh, in, in possible uh, attacking activities and patterns and all that. That, that was the second point you, you were raising, right? Is that it? Yeah, okay. So, maybe. So, the, obviously the question is to me. So, let me answer the first one. Uh, I think your question just now was surrounding the validity of the syslogs and all the digital information stored and how to protect yourselves from being pointed out by certain malicious programs or, or person. I would say that... Uh, Yes, um, Malaysians has provided laws, Computer Crime Act, Digital Signature Act, and, 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 and also uh, Communication and Multimedia Act, in addition to our traditional laws that we have, including Internal Security Act. Okay, um, I would say that um, in many cases, or at this moment in time, not many of these uh, uh, computer-related cases are brought to court. 
So I would say that we uh, there are many learning processes that need to be uh, done. There are many uh, uh, pioneer cases that need to be seen. So I would not like I do not want to co to to sit further whether whether um, the validity of the sis law can be challenged or not. But I would rather say that if there are uh, uh, cases of, of criminal in nature, let us test it. Let us really put it through into the systems so that we can know whether the system works or the, the system lacks a certain understanding. So if the system lacks a certain understanding or, or certain measures, then those can be improved. But all in all, I would say that these all laws uh, are the learning process for everyone. For us, it is a learning process because we need to learn what is lawful and what is not. For prosecutors, they need to learn how to prosecute. And for the judges, they need to learn how to understand the issues properly. So th these are all sequences of, 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 of processes that need, need to also mature by time. Okay? That's what. And then possible challenge on the validity of the system law. Yes, there's always possibility to challenge the validity of the laws. But the investigators are not stupid, I would say. There are always motives to a certain crimes. There are always linkages. There are, there are always traces that, uh, that can be concluded whether you are the victim or you are the initiator of those, uh, of those attacks, for example. So it is not that simple to just accuse a, a person to be uh, a perpetrator without having to have concrete evidence of, of so. So in, in this, uh, in this uh, area, um, again, I, I would say that uh, we need to test the, the scenario, we need to test uh, uh, the systems in order to, uh, to know whether it works or not. How effective is the uh, uh, Computer Crime Act and Digital Signature Act? Again, I say we have to uh, uh, we have to test it. We have to push it through. And I see that the, the uh, in the Malaysian context, the, the computer computer related or computer crimes related uh, uh, prosecutions are still low. So uh, it could be because people are hesitated to report, or is it because it could be because something else? It could be because of bureaucracy. We need to know this. We need to improve ourselves. Next uh, on the internet, storm center like. Yes, NISA has the, uh, the, the uh, internet storm center like in the states uh, <coughs> operating and, 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 and I would say analyzing the, uh, the situation of the, uh, of the countries. And, and not only that, we have only uh, element of sensors or, or say, uh, I would say um, early warnings in Malaysia, we also have collaboration with other other certs in other countries. We have cooperation with Asia Pacific certs, consists of 15 countries in Asia Pacific, including China, Japan, Australia. So, so usually when there are attacks, uh, not only that we rely on our own data within a domestic context, but we are also uh, getting some information from this country as well as the states. And we correlate those uh, to, uh, before concluding the severity of, those, of, of the situation. If any one of you would like to join in and, and contribute, you are most welcome. Just email us. We will uh, put you to our HoneyNet project, as long as you can contribute. Okay? The problem here is that many people would like to join the project, but only as a receiver. Uh, we have problem with that. There, there are too many receivers. We want contributors. If you feel that you can contribute, you can add value to the project, by all means, please come. Talk to me. I'll put you in. Uh, but if you're just receiving and receiving and receiving, I think uh, we need to move on. We have to improve the system. That's my answer. I hope I'm answering your, your, your question clearly. Ned? Thank you. A any members of the panel that to add to that? Uh, no? no. Okay. Uh, any other comments or questions from the floor? This question is for Penel. 
Um, uh, Colonel and Theo, actually. Uh, I mean, we know NISA is the national security. I mean, you guys are supposed to protect Malaysia, some sort, isn't it? Okay, and uh, I'm sure you all use a lot of uh, security software in your in your in your own environment and all that. Uh, mostly open source. I'm sure there is a lot and. Open SSH is one uh, is part of it. You know, it's the main thing that everybody uses. Uh, what is Nizer giving back to the development of uh, Open SSH or OpenBSD? Thank you for the question. Yes, Nizer is created or is 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 created by the gov by the by the government of Malaysia to assist the Malaysian communities in. Uh, enduring the, the security issues over the cyberspace. We are not the enforcement agency. We are not police. We are not, we do not have the powers to investigate you, to confiscate you. We are only advisors, technical advisors to the government, to the private sectors and the, to, to the communities. So we are a friendly guy. So you can always approach us. Okay? Uh, that's, I have to give you the correct image of, of what we are. Okay. What is our contribution to this open source? Things. Okay. NICER is focusing on the providing security services to the communities, to the internet communities per se. Contributing to open source in, in, in many ways uh, actually involves the dimension of research, which requires some research resources. And in doing this, I would say currently NICER has little contribution. We have contributions by our members to, to the open source group by uh, providing some signatures uh, on SNOT and things like that. But I would say that our contribution is very, very small. Okay, But there are other agencies in Malaysia that contribute to open source. For example, MIMOS has the uh, research arms. MIMOS is the Malaysian uh, uh, microelectronic system, which is the uh, government R&D for Malaysia, for, for your information. They have, they have the R&D arms that, that promotes open source, and they have researchers in, 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 uh, which are supposed to go deeper and, and, and contribute to the development and progress of open source in whatever form. So I, I would say that uh, these agencies would be, uh, would be the agencies that you should uh, communicate with if you would like to join in, in giving contributions in, in, in open source uh, uh, projects. Have I answered that question? What do you want us to do? You want us to... Yeah, that was clear. Uh, Theo, uh, can I have your view? <laughs> okay, now you want me to jump in. and uh, I, I believe I've been set up here to answer something. <laughs> so... so. Uh, I understand what the question is, and uh, and I, I wish to say that you're perhaps accusing actually the wrong people of not helping open source. There are people who do research, and people who do research are going to supply research information, and that's fine for them. I, I think who you're really what you're really trying to do is bait me to actually say who's not helping the open source community. And, <laughs> And that's the vendors, the vendors who use the open source community to provide things, to provide products that they then include in their operating systems and then give nothing back. That's the people who are actually uh, the ones that you should really think that, you, that, that are causing a, a big problem for us. For example, OpenSSH is now integrated in pretty much every single operating system in the world except for Microsoft Windows. And yet, we've never received a, a cent from any of those vendors who've incorporated it. Okay? Not from Sun, not from HP, not from IBM, not from SGI, not from Mac, not from Apple. Um, not from Cisco, and yet they're incorporating these things. But on the other hand, this is kind of what, what, why we did the OpenSSH development. We were afraid of vendors going and implementing their own SSH, implementing uh, the SSH protocol themselves, and then making mistakes. And um, on the internet, my security depends on everybody else's security. That's the, that's how the framework works. Okay, so. It's better for us to write an implementation and give it away so that everybody can then use it and because we believe that we're some of the best people writing secure software. So it's better for us to do that and then hand it out to them and have them use it than for them to go and write their own. 
I mean, that's really scary. Like, can you imagine if uh, if uh, IBM had gone and written their own SSH implementation, and uh, Sun had gone and written their own SSH implementation, and Cisco and Apple, and we'd have uh, 35 vendors with their own SSH implementations? It would be a, a field of like it'd be ripe for harvest. There'd be a constant stream of SSH vulnerabilities in all these products, and. There's people who sometimes say we haven't done perhaps the best job, but I don't know. A piece of software that's only had two security holes in five years, that's pretty damn rare when it is a piece of software that's that critical in the infrastructure side of things. And so last Sunday was actually the, um, um, the fifth birthday of the OpenSSH project. And, uh, And just uh, just as the birthday was approaching, we actually um, did a, another scan, uh, and we discovered that OpenSSH is 93% um, of the SSH server uh, surface, servers answering on the internet. Well, we only scanned one 825th of the internet, but we think that's probably representative of reality. Um, and that's a scary monoculture, but it's a lot scary, a lot less scary than other monocultures that we have on the internet with approximately the same percentage. Okay. <laughs> I think I'll just leave it at that. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Uh, and any other? Yes, Dinesh. I think I'll save Colonel off the hook with this one and uh, address it to Theo, Adam, and Jose. Uh, you guys have spoken at security conferences and mingled with uh, security practitioners all over the world. You've spent the last two days at the conference delivering papers, talking to the attendees, and people at the CDF. Uh, what do you think of Malaysia's security readiness, just based on, on, on a gut feel of what you've, you've seen here? Perhaps, I know it's a very subjective question, but uh, your views will be very important. Okay, so in general, uh, uh, my, my, my thinking about, you know, the, the security community in Malaysia, uh, you know, I see no difference from the Western countries, from the U.S. So I've been going around the world and speaking different cons. So for me, there is no difference. Yeah. So maybe the the Lampianas atmosphere is better here. Yeah. So because of the you know uh, people are all different in Southeast Southeast Asia. Yeah. So um, my my other point that I would like to say is that I think that you know when it comes to, for example, some hacking activity. I, I think that people here are maybe much more active. Yeah. So, because, you know, so th this is my impression, yes, yeah, so um, that I get from you know speaking with people, talking about different things and about different subjects. So these are just general impressions. So I didn't actually had enough time to talk with the, all of the people that I wanted to talk, so uh, Seen no difference, better atmosphere, so very nice event, and that, that's all. Thank you. I think that my perception has been very positive as well. Um, I, I guess I didn't expect anything less than that. Um, <laughs> so compared, I've, I've yeah, I've gone to like DefCon a bunch of times, and I'm really happy to see that no one threw, uh, I think, a dishwashing soap in fountains and stuff like that. Um, much more mature in that respect. Um, people have been very friendly, been very very happy about that. It's not something I also see very often at places like DefCon or Black Hat. Um, it's funny because I one of the things I, I get to do is I get to monitor a large chunk of the internet um, and research that, and a lot of the scans don't come from Malaysia. Of course, they come from Taiwan or Korea and Singapore, um, which is funny. <laughs> um, so it's I I I, uh, I guess that kind of sort of backs up the this region is a little more active than other regions in the world uh, statement that Adam made. <laughs> um, but it's been really positive. Like I said, uh, people have been like I said very nice and very friendly. Um, very good things going on in terms of things, uh, but so very good. Um, I think there's more hacking going on here than there is in the U.S. these days. Um, but that's not bad because you guys are learning, and eventually you'll stop playing around and you'll get jobs, and then you'll. <laughs> 
Okay? And then you'll start doing development. But largely by then you'll probably be working for companies or building products for them. Okay? So I think that there's something that's, that's, that's wrong with this entire thing. There's not enough development coming out of here, especially in the open source community. You can learn a lot by writing open source software, and you should be. You don't have to go break into systems, okay? Um, so, something I've been keeping track of for a while is um, open source development where, and where in the world it actually happens. Now, open source software is largely a northern hemisphere thing. Okay, uh, maybe that has to do with the fact that most open source software development actually happens when it's when when it's uh, snow when there's snow on the ground outside. Okay, and that doesn't happen here. Um, but you guys are still a northern hemisphere country. Okay, so you can you can get involved in that whole thing. Okay, and uh, the right way for you guys to start doing open source software is to just start, just start writing stuff. Okay, just just start writing stuff. Uh, there's people here who I've been talking to who have the skills, and they can start participating, and they can start producing good stuff. And I think you should just leave the when you leave here today, you should go home and you should start writing open source software. Start finding bugs, and start fixing them, and start teaching yourself how to get better at it. And eventually, when you get a job, you're going to discover the job sucks, and then you're going to be able to go home. And when you go home, you're going to continue writing open source software, and you're going to like it a lot more. Okay? Just. Just a theory, that's how it's worked out for me. Thanks. Just to back up what Theo said, um, my background's actually in biochemistry, and I got into this basically playing around with open source software. And through it, I met the right people, and I wind up with a decent job, and I get to travel the world doing it. So do it, it's a lot of fun, it pays off. Well, yeah, maybe I just add a few words to that. We, we've been trying very hard to get people in this country, especially, to, to write more open source software, to start open source or contribute to open source projects and all that. And so far, you know, we haven't been very successful. Perhaps with this encouragement, you know, we, we, we can try and, and do something more about that. And I think, you know, it's about time that, you know, most of us, instead of just being mere users, it's time we can try and contribute something back. Um, but there's an observation, right? I mean, in, in this country, most of the software writers here, they are basically application programmers in that sense. And there are very few system developers. And most open source projects are system software, you see. Well, then, well, maybe you can um, I'd actually disagree. Um, I think that's about to change. And the system software part um, is largely solved. Okay, so the open source wave that's going to come over the next 10 years is going to be on the application software side. And I, since a lot of the industries in Asia are very much application type product development, even when they're building hardware, like they're building like RS-232 USB dongles and stuff like that, or whatever they're building, those are, those are application end side things. They're, they're not a whole system, they're a small piece of a big system. Um, but um, there's an anecdote, that, uh, an example of how you do something that I gave earlier on. I just want to tell this little thing to the whole audience at once. Someone asked me, how do I start writing open source software? And I said, there's two ways. There's two ways, okay? I said, how do you learn how to ride a bike? You do it in two ways. One, you look and see how other people ride bikes. And then two, you start riding the bike. Okay? And the open source projects are really organized around you being able to watch how other people do development because we're using CVS and we're using repository control systems. So you can actually look at the changes that developers have made as they evolved a piece of software from its beginning all the way to the end. You can watch and see what each of the steps was. You can look at mailing lists and see the thoughts of the developers and you can, you can learn what the, the mental processes were and then you can learn how to develop those mental processes yourself. And then you just have to get on the bike and ride it. And if you fall, big deal, get back on the bike. Okay? Yeah, good words of encouragement. Um, any other? Yes. One. Okay, maybe just time for just one more. Oh, John? Yeah, maybe you, you want to come here and. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, maybe you just like to sum up, you know, what what you have said the the last two days and have a, a few the last few words, you know, uh, to the to the audience. Okay, uh, I found it to be a very interesting conference, and I learned an awful lot about the Asian ISPs 
as well, and I really enjoyed uh, giving a talk, and I'm really glad you enjoyed the uh, the uh, tandem stacking session and viruses. And uh, I hope you learned enough about how to deal with your spam problem, uh, because I did talk a little bit about that. And uh, since I came in here kind of cold, maybe you can ask me any questions you'd like, and I'll do the best I can to answer them. Yeah, uh, any particular questions addressed to John uh, about, what, about his current work, about the work he has done in the past, about spam? About freaking. All right. Well, we'll give this a bit of advice. Um, if you really want to have a very good and very pleasant email experience, my recommendation is you have three email addresses. One email address on your business card that you give out to anybody you'd like, and you use that same email address to sign up for websites for promotional deals. Use that, that email address to perhaps join mailing lists. But then you have a private email address. The private email address should be an address that has got a very hard to guess name with lots of numbers in it perhaps. Something that a dictionary attack program will not find. Give it only to your very close friends. Be careful of who you give it to. One interesting feature that my Spam Crunchers program will have is that uh, if any of my Spam Crunchers users wants to email to somebody, a random hash number is attached to the end of the email address. For instance, crunch8375 at, at spamcrunchers.com would go to 8375 would mean that that email address is unique to only that one person who I emailed to. And if I go and I check my spam and I find out that I get a spam mailed to crunch8375, I look up in my database and I know who gave that email address out or who got infected. Uh, one interesting uh, thing that I did was uh, I uh, notified Waz, Steve Wozniak, of what my new email address was. Shame on him. He put it out into the joke list. And so, right now to this very day, I'm getting a virus, at least two copies of the virus every day. It, all, it comes from an Earthlink account only. It comes from only one IP address. So there's one machine out there that's on an Earthlink network that is sending me a virus. And I know exactly where it came from. It's one of Steve Wozniak's friends, and I don't know who it is. But their machine is infected. But I already know that it's one of his friends because uh, of that of that leak. And so far, I've had absolutely zero spam on that email address. All my other email addresses, like crunch at webcrunchers.com and crunch at shopip.com, and all those email addresses have lots and lots of spam. Of course, I filter it all out anyway. But those are the ones that give out to all my friends. And if you also do a lot of mailing lists and join a lot of mailing lists, my recommendation is you have a special email address that collects all the email, your email lists. That way you don't get your email lists mixed up with your personal mail. So whenever you are expecting an important message, you can join as many emailing lists as you want. For instance, I joined the OpenBSD.org emailing list. and. I don't have to worry about waiting through a lot of open, openbsd.org uh, CBS mail, mail messages coming in because it all goes to that one address. So I, and whenever I want to go in there and read my list mail, I can. But it's not actually rammed down my throat when I don't want it. And that's an important thing, too. And that's why I suggest you have three. One for mailing lists, one a private one, and one you give out to all your friends and you don't care about uh, spam. Thank you. Any, maybe one last question and com or comment before we wrap up? Yes. Um, good afternoon. Um, uh, um, after listening to uh, Adam Galski's about the uh, vulnerability of Java inside 3G applications and after the previous um, talk, it's kind of scary because most phones are going towards that, having 3G applications, you know, having 3G capabilities and all. So uh, do you have a suggestion how users can protect themselves from this kind of exploits? Thank you. Okay. 
problem is actually very difficult because uh, I think that, as far as I know, this is the first time that actually such a threat has been presented uh, for mobile devices. So, as far as I know, vendors have implemented the fixed reference implementation of Java 2 Micro Edition for their phones. So, but of course, due to the fact that, that you know changing the phone software is not such an easy process because it usually requires contacting service, you know, flashing the whole memory, etc. That that's make the whole thing a bit com complicated. Yeah. So my goal here, speaking about Java vulnerabilities, was not to to you know escalate the whole threat. I just wanted to increase the awareness among the users about such threats. So people are not aware that it's possible to, to do almost everything with, with their phones. So uh, I proved that many things can be actually done with you know, my Nokia phone. So and I, I think that the most important thing that could, should come after my presentation, and that, that the lesson that, that, for example, vendors should take is that we need some technological changes, yeah, uh, because I expect that within the next half of the year uh, we will have remote vulnerabilities for mobile devices, and that should be a problem, the real problem, because as far as for now, uh, downloading Java application onto the phone handset requires user action, yeah. Uh, it usually requires uh, that they agree to, to the installation of a given midlet and they, mu they must want to run a given midlet. Yeah? So this is, as actually, as for now, this is just a passive attack and user side attack. We should start thinking about remote vulnerabilities, about future threats, and I think that vendors should undertake some step steps to, to make changes to the whole technology because currently the technology and vendors, this includes antivirus industry, is not prepared for these threats. And as for the users themselves, I think that care, very much care sh should be taken while downloading any Java, mobile Java applications to their phones. Of course, I don't think whether you know, malicious midlets uh, will appear in a very short period of time. It took me about four months to actually prove that something malicious can be done on my phone. And, you know, writing in a malicious code is very phone specific. It's not the matter of just writing one code that can be pulled to any other uh, phone handset. So, just take care and, and think about the threats before you, you know, run on Java mobile phone and just wait for the patches if they are going to be released by mobile phone vendors because uh, from the Lotus vulnerabilities that have been released a year and a half ago, uh, I can just say that it's, it's, it's not a short process. It doesn't take uh, a little time. It takes you know, a bit more time to, for vendors to release any patches. Just take care. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no, anything? If there are not, then I, I think it's been a very long day, and we would like to wrap this up. So I thank all the panelists again. Let's show them our position. Uh, we, we end the, the event. Is, is that it, Belinda? So, okay, then we hope to see you all again next year. So, have a good day then. Thank you.